Welcome into the Inside Bassmaster Podcast. Ronnie Moore, your host here, and my co-host, as always, the man, Kyle Jesse. Not only is he the digital content editor of Bassmaster.com, he is a world traveler. He's been to the St. Lawrence, to ICAST, and now back into Birmingham. They're going to send you off somewhere else soon, but thank you for joining me today for the episode 86 of the podcast. We've done quite a bit of these since we fired this back up for 2022, and Kyle, today we got a special one. We're going to have Elite Series champion. And rookie of the year leader, Jay Shakir on the podcast. Yeah, definitely excited to get to uh, talk to Jay, pick his brain a little bit more about this event. Uh, I've had the opportunity to hang around Jay quite a bit this year. Uh, shot a boat tour with him, which you can check out on Bassmaster.com. Um, really enjoyed getting to know him and, you know, obviously awesome to see him, uh, you know, pull out the giant victory. You know, history was was made there in, at the St. Lawrence River and, uh Definitely looking forward to uh, getting to talk to him a little bit more about it. Yeah. Pry, pry some information from him. We're going yeah, exactly. to get after him. Well, Kyle, he uh, obviously Jay Shakira is a, one of the Midwestern guys, so he already prefaced it. I'm not going to get too excited. I might not cry on stage. I might not, I mean, I might not fist pump the air. He's just going to have that $1 million smile that he's got. He's got a great set of teeth on him and a great smile. And what a young champion we have, 102 pounds, nine ounces, the first one to unofficially do it on the water. And then we made it official at the weigh-in later with him and Corey Johnston, both breaking 100 pounds. And we're going to get a little bit of insight from him, hopefully a lot of insight and some storytelling, really explain maybe who Jay Shakir is because he's had about 10 days or so to reflect on that win. So Kyle, I'm going to go ahead, if you don't mind, I'm going to bring in Jay to the show and, uh, and see what his thoughts are on his big victory. Uh, not only is it his first elite series title, but it is his uh, a record breaking one in many ways. Not only a hundred plus pounds, youngest rookie winner ever or youngest angler ever to win. Um, and then there were so many other accolades that the St. Lawrence river uh, had happened this week. And so to have Jay on the podcast is going to be something special today. Yeah, absolutely. And like you said, the thing that I've thought about all day, uh, leading up to shooting this podcast was the fact that there's so much to talk about with this win. Like you said, obviously history being made with, you know, being the youngest winner in elite series history, obviously breaking 100 pounds for the first time in elite series history. Um, you know, Jay's story and, and, you know, how he pulled it off, I think was just incredible. And I'll say this before he gets on here, but, um, early on in the event, even, uh, Dalton Tumblin and I were talking about who we were going to cover things of that nature. And, and uh, I thought to myself, you know, well, you know, Dalton is probably for the best to go cover a Johnson brother just because odds are over the course of four days, they're going to make it work. And uh, boy, was I wrong. So uh, looking forward to getting to, to talk to Jay a little more. One thing you mentioned was that, uh, you know, Jay didn't cry on stage, but we're going to do our <laughs> best. There he is. We're going to make him cry on this. We're going to get him a hundred percent. We're going to get Jay to cry. Jay, appreciate you joining us. We were waiting for you to pop in and we have done that. Uh, Man, first off, I have to say congratulations on your win. Not only did you Thanks. win in style, uh, but I will say you proved me wrong. I said, man, I'm not so sure. We were high on the Jay Shakurit train early in the season. What a dominant yeah. couple of events. In the last couple of events, I've been like, man, he opened the door wide open, and now we're starting to see some names we thought would factor. Will Jay win it? I'm not quite sure. Will I literally said to Kyle on the podcast before the St. Lawrence, I said, we will know a lot more about the rookie of the year race after the St. Lawrence. If Jay shows up, then he could definitely be in it to win it. And we're not so sure. And boy, did you show up? I mean, knocked it out. Uh, <laughs> luckily Jacob Fouts held his own a little bit. So that race is still close, but congratulations, man. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Of course. And Kyle was eager to do this one. Cause he said he got to see you at ICAST for just a moment because you were signing mm -hmm. so many babies and kissing so many, <laughs> so many folks and signing endorsement deals. But first off, it's probably the question everyone asks in a podcast. What's it been like? It's been about nine days since you won and you really didn't have the words that I cast to kind of encapsulate what it meant to you. It still hadn't really sunk in too much during the tournament as well. So now that we've had almost a week and a half, has it sunk in for you? It has. It has. I've finally been able to sit down and uh, just look at the trophy sitting on the floor and just being able to get back to everybody that I've always talked to, you know, around my house and all the people that I tournament fish with and fish against. Um, you know, that's that's what I really like to 
just reach out to the people that have always talked to me, you know, for the past, before I won the tournament. Now there's been countless hundreds of people that have been congratulating me, which I'm super thankful, thankful for as well. Um, especially going into ICAS, I did not think that um, that many people were really paying attention to that tournament, but it was truly pretty unbelievable to see all the people that were watching. And, you know, when they just saw me walking around, they would stop to congratulate me. And yeah, I was really thankful for that. So Jay, you kind of mentioned it there. Obviously, a lot of people reaching out to you. Um, over the last week and a half or so, has there been one person that's reached out to you that was a little surprising or that has meant more to you than anything? Like Michael Jordan, um, Tom Brady, anybody like that? Yeah, no, I would have <laughs> to like say um, what Polinick did for me. Uh, not only after the tournament, but it was like during the final day weigh in, he took like a bunch of pictures for me and congratulated me. And, uh, I've looked up to him for a long time and that was really just was super nice of him to do that for me. And, uh, yeah, that was probably one person that really, really stood out to me after the tournament. I'll have to say early in the elite series time, 2006, 2007, when you were about a wee little lad, probably like three years old, it seems. Uh, I, I kid, you were probably like six or seven, I think, in 2006. Um, but for you, you're a Midwest guy. You're from Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. And I will say at the beginning of the elite series time, 06, 07, 08, maybe even in the earlier 2000s than that, we saw a big West coast influx. We, you know, we saw some guys coming over from the West coast and moving to the East coast to just be closer to the tournaments we were having, or we saw a lot of them rise up in tournaments and have different techniques that they really showcased to the world. Didn't know over the last five years, I got to say that new hot area of the country isn't Alabama. It's, it's that Wisconsin, Minnesota. I mean, Idaho, I'm going to put that in there. You know, the whole, yeah. that whole upper portion of the country that not only has dirty rivers, but small mouth places as well. Mm -hmm. We've seen multiple winners come out of there. We've seen people have to qualify through events that were up in that region. And it's really taken them all over. I'll even go to the nation with, with a guy like Rich Lindgren, who is, yeah. who's from Minnesota, has done well across the board. What is it about Caleb Kufal, you, Bob Downey, Seth Fighter, Austin Felix, Josh Doe, so many guys in that range that just seem come in, they come in prepared or comfortable. It's just because we have everything like people don't understand, like you just pointed out, um, dirty rivers, current flowages, clear lakes, stream. I mean, we have literally every like within two hours of my house, I could go fish a grass lake for largemouth. I could go fish Sturgeon Bay for smallmouth. I could go to the Mississippi River and fish for both. I could go up north and fish a glacial lake for largemouth and smallmouth. Or I could go down to like say Madison and fish a chain of lakes for largemouth, and that's more, you know, like a dirtier lake kind of style. I mean, we just have it all. It, besides like some of the crazy stuff like a Santee or, a, you know, like a Lake Fork, that sort of thing. We don't have that, but we have like most of the basics that you cover that we go to, and then. You know, I could even point out to maybe even a little bit of a Tennessee River area. You know, we have some lakes that set up not similar, but I mean, our fish do group up on offshore places like that. So, I mean, yeah, you know, our guys have fished for fish offshore and we have a good handle on majority of everything, every place that we go to. And I imagine being able to fish maybe, you know, not year round, obviously also helps yeah. make you that much more eager. <laughs> Or appreciate yeah. whenever you get to fish in the in the winter time, especially now you being on the elite series, you know, obviously starting your year way earlier than you would maybe on a normal year. But uh, so here's a question that I've got, and I've been thinking about this pretty much all morning. Obviously, you know, I'm sure Ronnie will hit on this more as well. But you got the you're basically the first person to weigh in a hundred pounds if you think about it, like on the water, you're the first person to catch a hundred pounds mm -hmm. of smallmouth, and then also the youngest elite series champion. Those are two things that are incredible as they are to you, which one is more important and or a bigger deal. And which one do you think has the best chance of being broken? Ooh. Um, so I'll start off with best chance of being broken. The best chance of being broken is going to be the youngest angler. I think over the hundred pounds. Um, I say that because, like you saw, you guys have seen it within the last couple of years. Like the younger generation right now is just on an absolute tear. I mean, you're going to see guys in the elite series at 21 years old, and it would not surprise me that they win a tournament in one year. 
I mean, it would not surprise me at all if you saw it in the next two or three years. Now, the 100-pound thing, yeah, I think it could get broken easily. Um, it just – it all depends on that weather. Like, that week we had, that was like – you'll never see that again in four, five, six, ten tournaments. Who knows how when you'll ever see that again. Um, I mean, yeah, that could get broken sooner than that, but I think the the age thing was – in. what was your other question? <laughs> That was pretty much it. As far as yeah, yeah, yeah. To, to add a comment to your, your young gun thing. Um, I think by the time we're all three done doing this, we'll have elite series anglers that are having their parents drive them to the ramp. At some point that's bound to happen, but Ronnie, I'm sure you've, you've got some more to add to that. As well, well, the close, the closest thing we've had to that was Bradley Roy who qualified at 18 mm. and he was basically getting his parents yeah. to take him places, but it, it's very cool to see that. And we talked about it last year and throughout the season that eight of the top 15 in the Northern opens last year. And, and we don't see this in every division. It, it just could be the anglers that qualify or the fisheries that they, they compete on. But half of the top 15 in the Northern opens last year were under 25 years old. And I don't know if that's an electronics thing for Oneida, St. Lawrence and, and James river and the Southerns it's, it's different old school approaches to get in the top mm-hmm. 10 of points, but it is interesting to see the young generation. We mentioned it before. I said uh, Casey Ashley and Derek Rimmitz broke that record um, or set that record at least in 2007. At tw- They were both 23 years old, or I think uh, maybe Rimmitz was 24, and then Casey broke it later that year being 23 in four months. And I have to give a hat tip to Alex Redwine because he said, well, who's the youngest elite champion ever? Yeah. And I'm like, it's like 9 o'clock at night. I'm like, I don't know, bro. <laughs> like, is, is it going to be Jay? I'm not, I'm not sure. Let me look up. And I looked it up and I was like, wow, by four months he did because he just turned 23. So huge kudos to that. And I will say, um, I'll go against you. And I think that I think that we'll see over 102 pounds, nine ounces of smallmouth at a place because Kyle's been here on the elites since we've had it happen. But at Mille Lacs in the three day events. We had 75, yeah, sure. 77, and then St. Clair, we had like, I think Fighter yeah. had like 79. I would love to, we saw the St. Lawrence in the fall for the Open have 70. I would love to see a four-day event in the fall for smallmouth. But like you said, that weather deal, I mean, oh, it yeah. is absolutely brutal to get consistent weather. My only fear is that we go to Oahe and they break 102 pounds, nine ounces there because we get pristine weather as well. If they, If we yeah. do that... <laughs> We'll have to do another video just to give you, yeah, the, right. the, you know, the, the kudos for the one time you got to lead it. But um, have you got to pre-fish any lakes this year? And if so, I know you didn't pre-fish the St. Lawrence and that's your best finish of the year. Can't get much better than that. But for the other six elites prior to this, had you pre-fished any of those? And if so, did it end up hurting or helping? Yeah, so I did pre-fish for St. John's and Harris Chain. I went early just to get, yeah, just to get the bugs out of the, the system. And I was just a little bit nervous, you know, first two tournaments. And then uh, I did not pre-fish Santee, but I went to Chickamauga for one day just to run around and get familiar with areas I wanted to look at, things like that. The only problem was when I did go there, um, it was flooded, which did not help me at all. It kind of hurt me, I think, a little bit. And then um, – or other two fork and pickwick. pickwick so pickwick i've been to before i fished an open there that's uh, right when i qualified i finished 17 so i was shad somewhat spawn, familiar right? with pickwick yeah that was a shad spawn tournament so it was a little bit different when we went there and i did not uh not go and pre-practice that so i would say the florida trip definitely helped me a lot and then chickamauga helped me some and then that was it and then the next two that we have coming up, I went and pre-practice for Oahe, which was good. And then I've been to the cross a handful of times this before the cutoff this year. And then I fished, uh, I fished a handful of tournaments on the cross prior to this tournament. So when did you pre-fish Oahe? And is it the same, like some guys last year went the same month, you know, a year prior. Yeah. So it's consistent, but you weren't even you weren't qualified for the elites yet. I don't know. Yeah, no, I wasn't there last year. So I was there this year. I think it was somewhere around the 4th of July. Okay. It was a couple of weeks before our cutoff was, and then I spent three days over there and it was good. I mean, I'm excited to get back out there and see what I found and see what's changed because it's going to change a decent amount from to when we go back, it's going to be a little hotter when we go there this time. 
So Jay, obviously doing a lot of talking about uh, different, you know, bodies of water, things of that nature. You go win a tournament to the magnitude that you just won against the best smallmouth fishermen of all time. You get a say in what the best five smallmouth fisheries are across the country. What are your top five smallmouth fisheries? Top five. Ooh. Well, Lake Ontario has got to be number one now. I mean, <laughs> what? yeah, the weights that place put out, I mean, that was ridiculous, especially for that time of the year. I mean, it's one thing to catch 100 pounds in May, but it's another thing to do it in July when they're all off the beds, too. I mean, and it was even during the in-between period. Like, they weren't even all out deep yet. So that was uh, pretty outstanding. And then I'd have to say number two, would be like a sturgeon bay it has gotten a lot of pressure the last couple of years but you still see the biggest smallmouths come out of that place um year in and year out i mean there's seven eight pounders caught every single spring out of that place in may and june and i mean it's good all year too um gosh i don't fish like a ton of like tournament based smallmouth fisheries so i don't like have the say in like saying like a lake erie or like big places but i have like some small like just small lake give us your honey hole give us your honey hole. <laughs> he's basically saying i can't tell you my little spots kyle <laughs> you can and you can even make a top three we don't have to do top five yeah that's yeah. fun yeah, yeah yeah ontario sturgeon bay and then another one would be like a saint Clair. yeah uh when that when it comes to that um you got to fish a certain bait for smallmouth, obviously. And one of those baits or techniques is a drop shot. So what made you pick a striking half shell for your drop shot compared to maybe a Z2 or, you know, uh, something else in their lineup mm -hmm. or, or other baits? Did you see, a, did you try other things and then notice that the half shell, whether it was the profile or what it was, but why that one? Because Mark Zona was beaming with pride that you got it done on a bait that he helped design. Yeah, so I tried, I actually tried, like you said, pretty much every striking bait I had in my arsenal during practice just to see what they reacted to because every fish reacts a little, little bit different when the drop shot hits the bottom and they get to look at it for the first time for two or three seconds. Um, and it seemed like, I would get bit on that first initial fall with a half shell, like almost half of the time, which for a ratio out there, those fish were a little bit pressured and they're pretty smart. I mean, it, it might not look like they were that smart on video, but when you were looking at them on the, uh, on the screen, they were pretty smart. And it seemed like about half the time you could get bit on the half shell. Whereas if you threw some sort of minnow style or something that was a little bit, you know, more flash to it, I, I stuck to more like a natural green pumpkin. It's almost like see-through in that half shell. I mean, it's really hard to see in the water. And uh, yeah, it just seemed more subtle. And it's, it was more of just a confidence thing at the end of the day. Um, you know, I, I fished with it this spring, actually, a bunch. And I won a couple tournaments on the half shell this spring. So it kind of led into me using it. And I just had really just my confidence was just blowing up with it. So, you know, it worked out there. So for you, it wasn't a deep area necessarily. When we think of Lake Ontario, Kyle and I talk about it off camera all the time. You think about Lake Ontario, you think of just the ocean and everything is deep, but there are shallow areas on Ontario as well. And they certain years, certain times of year they play, like in July, we saw that. For you, the depth, did that matter? Or more so was it the bait? Because Davey Hype mentioned that on live. He talked to you and you said there was bait present. For one, you never hear that on the St. Lawrence River. You always hear about presence of gobies or I caught gobies or I did yeah. gobies or crawfish, whatever it is. But like literally you said bait, which tells me that's probably bait fish, which mm -hmm. if that's the case, how did they react? And were you, I mean, I guess, did you have a lot of experience with bait oriented smallmouth compared to crustacean oriented smallmouth? You know, they probably act a little different. Yeah, they do act a little different. Um, these ones out here suspended a lot more than any smallmouth I've ever fished for. I mean, when I actually found these fish the day of the tournament, now they moved, I think from what I gathered, they moved around like 80 yards off of where I found them in practice. And where I found them in practice, the bait was a little bit shallower. It was in like 12 to 13. And I think that was just because of the way the wind was positioned and how it was blowing in onto the spot when I found it. And when I ended up finding the fish in the tournament, they're 80 yards outside of 
where they were in practice and the bait had slid out a little bit deeper into that 15 to 20 foot range is basically where the bait was. And, you know, when I found them, they were stacked from like three feet under the surface all the way down to 18. And when I threw my drop shot in there, I think I caught one on the fall. And uh, yeah, it was pretty ridiculous just the way that they reacted. Um, to, to really, I mean, you probably could have threw just about anything in there the first day of the tournament, but once the tournament started going on, I mean, they got, they got pretty educated. And that's why I asked about the Z2 compared to the half shell, because yeah. if I'm looking at one that looks like a bait fish, that's the Z2. And if I look at one yeah. that maybe looks like a goby or something different. So very cool that you use that. Kyle, you have anything uh, for Jay, but as we go to probably transition and segue. Yeah, so, uh, you know, let's talk about Rookie of the Year, obviously. I'm sure you've, you've been asked about that a good bit. Obviously, the majority of this season, that's been, uh, you know, you've been at the top of that list, obviously, on a lot of bodies of water. I'm assuming you probably hadn't fished really until this year. But um, just talk about, you know, kind of your, your goals for the rest of the season. Obviously, two events left, uh, kind of your outlook on the rest of the season just in general. Yeah, so my goals the rest of the season are to make two more cuts, the top 47 cuts. And I think if I do that, I'll be in good position to make the classic. And then on top of that, if I do, you know, maybe a little bit better than the top 47 in cuts, I'll be in good position for rookie of the year. So, I mean, that's, that's my only two goals left for the year are just to, you know, make two cuts and win rookie of the year and get into the classic. That's really all I'm thinking about. Um, and I might, that might play into a little bit of a, strategic factor when it comes to the cross because you know you get to the cross you have a lot of options there you have you can lock up to seven you can lock down to nine and you know depending on what kind of position I'm in after that tournament or after Oahe you know I might have to play it a little bit smart and just go out and catch fish instead of trying to win also you want to make sure you're still nice to the other 90 anglers on the elite series in case you get stuck on a sandbar at the Mississippi yeah. River which it yeah, seems like right. it's very you know you got to get brought in um, or you got you got enough money for some, you know, months or tow, tow service. Uh, I'm not going to go. I'm not going there anymore than I just with it. Um, so we talked about the people who've reached out to you. Uh, have you had any companies reach out to you? Maybe uh, not maybe a deal for the last two events, but maybe something for next year, some inquiries. That's a great time. There's never a good, there's never a, a better yeah. time to win an event, but there's a great time to win one right before I cast. Cause your name's hot. Just like Caleb Kufal right before the classic mm -hmm. last year, which we never have it, you know, in the summer, he was the hot name going into it because of his dominant Gunnersville win. So for you, was there any kind of connections that you have maybe hopeful that, Hey, yeah, not only is a hundred thousand going to help me, but now I might have some sponsor money for next year. Yeah. There was connections made at ICAST for sure. It was basically just getting to know the companies. I mean, every company is pretty much like a family. I mean, you just want to get to know the person in charge and get to know all the people that are working for them. And, you know, to see if you're a good fit for them and things like that. And, you know, I talked to a handful of companies at ICAST and it was good. You know, I was happy with where I came out of there at. And uh, I'm excited to see, you know, what's in store for next year. I'm sure there's going to be some changes and stuff like that. You're, it's weird to think that you've had a progression in your career as a 23 year old. You like, you know, you just, you just got out of high school and you're a pro. And so it's like, the, what progression could he have had? But, you fished as a co-angler. Like, can you walk back your story, you know, over the next couple minutes of you went, you went from local scene to co-angler on the opens. What benefits did you get there? And then obviously boater and your quick jump to the elites. And now your rookie year, you have a win. It's all happened so quickly, but mm -hmm. I know that it looks quick to the public, but I know as an angler mindset, it's, it's been on your, you know, your mind or your body for the last four or five, six years right. prepping to get to this just like a Brian new who was a co-angler for a long time. And then boom, we're like, wow, how did he get so successful? Was it because of your steps that you took and you did it the right way? I think so. I think the co-angler thing is definitely um, 100% no regrets on the co-angler thing. Like if I were to redo anything, like I don't think, I think I would honestly maybe fish another year as co-angler, to be honest. I think the co-angler thing is awesome. Uh, I learned probably three times as much as what I would have learned on my own just fishing college now fishing college would have been good too um I didn't take that approach just because I went to a tech school and we didn't have a team and I have a partner and it just living up here is a little bit different than you know going to college in an Alabama or something like that um 
but yeah, I mean, the co-angler thing was, was huge. I got to fish with so many names that, you know, I got to, for instance, I got to fish with Patrick Walter, Brandon Cobb, Austin Felix, like just guys that, you know, have done this stuff. And I, I can take that and learn in one day and they were on tough bodies of water and it's just nice to watch them fish and get that perspective. And then to be able to win two of those and then have the funding to jump in as a boater on the opens and then lucky enough to qualify for the elite series my first year was there ain't no luck we yeah. know that <laughs> i guess not yeah i don't know there's lucky there's lucky moments in it in an overall like there are, you know yeah. there's there's it's not luck that someone makes the elites but they have a lucky moment that that didn't go the other way but i guess uh some of those guys that you fished with probably didn't think that you'd be uh affecting yeah. their bank accounts so quickly i guess <laughs> yeah yeah i brought it up to patrick one time i was like hey do you remember me remember when i fished with you and he's like honestly i feel bad no i do not remember you at all <laughs> that was funny <laughs> well now he does after the saint lawrence he yeah. got affected by that financially so that's very funny uh kyle so jay obviously you talked a little bit about your progression there ronnie great segue to that question but um you know obviously your dad is a well-recognized walleye professional um you know has it ever been a consideration as you were growing up to maybe go that route what helped determine make that decision and do you ever have to remind your dad that it's called bass pro shops and not walleye pro shops <laughs> no um so actually most people don't really know but like anytime me and my dad would go fishing when i was like just starting to actually like get into it seriously like 11 12 13 um, we would only go bass fishing. We would never go walleye fishing for fun. Um, that was just something he did in tournaments and like, business and you know, pleasure. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's he, when he wanted to go fish for fun, he wanted to go fish for bass. And this was also the same time when I was 12, 13, that all this stuff just started exploding, like the high school fishing, the clubs, the nation, like everything was just getting huge. And like, we had so many team tournaments around here that I could jump in and fish for bass. Like we hardly had any, um, I mean, yeah, there was walleye tournaments, but there wasn't walleye tournaments that I could jump in when I was 16. Um, so it was a little bit different that way. And I think that's, that's the main reason why the whole bass thing just came about for me instead of the walleye. A couple, I guess, personal questions that are all along the same line um how did you get your connection with strike king and lose because you've had them since you were a co-angler which was like mm -hmm. you know when you you got your license yeah. you got your license and you signed with strike king and lose and then you, yeah. became, you know so how long did that, or how did that connection happen and then tell me about your title sponsor because we often think about when we look at guys wraps and trucks you know boats there's always companies on their wrap that aren't endemics they're not fishing companies necessarily baits wise and so it is kind of curious, like, who is that brand and what are they about, especially since they hopped in the truck and drove to come see you win? Not many, <laughs> not many sponsors do that. So take me back to that first partnership with a big time fishing company. And then now your title, um, you know, alongside Strike King and Lose. Yeah, so Strike King and Lose started about to win. So my dad was originally going to, he still is to this day, they're going to start making walleye products and they have started making walleye products with striking and loose. And at the time, you know, I wasn't really big into the whole tournament seeing this and that, but it was the same time when I won my first Colt Angler Open and they were like, oh, like, who's your kid? Like, like, would he be interested? And, and at the time, it wasn't like a huge deal or anything. It was just them helping me out a little bit, getting me some product and things like that. And uh, that's basically how it started. It was all through my dad and the whole wall ideal, which, you know, it goes back to this whole industry. I mean, it sucks to say it, but I mean, some of the people that you know and the, re the relationships that you have with people, they really do help with getting sponsorships and just reaching out and talking to people and having all these friends in the industry um truly does help with getting sponsors but yeah they were the ones that that reached out to me and wanted to help me out you know through the co-angler levels and then it just elevated to the to the opens and then now into the elites so yeah and then as far as your question goes um pertaining to whitewater my title sponsor now um they're they're brand new they they're just starting to get into the industry you know whitewater fishing it's a new clothing brand that's coming out and uh you know aaron he's he's the owner and he hopped in the truck with my dad and and jim and they drove all the way 
all the way to the way in to watch me weigh in and so did my girlfriend she slept in the car the whole time on the way there and uh, all the way through the night and yeah I mean for him to see that firsthand because he had never been to a weigh-in like that or anything and to see all that if you know he helped me out big time and you know without him and people like that it's just hard to do what we do and Jay, I've got, I've got a, a kind of a two pronged question here because one one of them just came to my head there. Uh, did your girlfriend try to take any credit for the win with those lucky jigs being in your boat? <laughs> yeah. uh, obviously, I got to shoot a boat tour with you this year. And if yeah. you, you want to get some more information on that, go check out that boat tour on Bassmaster.com. But did she try to take any credit for those lucky jigs? And did you actually catch them on those lucky jigs? <laughs> no credit no I don't even think she remembers it anymore to be honest with you no no I don't know she didn't take any credit for that and then no, one fish, thing was... no fish came on the uh the lucky jigs hey but <laughs> but they could have they could be a part of your ROI season if you if you follow through they, they've been with you the that's whole year true. you know we'll say that's that true so Jay tell me tell me this obviously I feel like most people um, you know, our general age, which is hard to say because you're significantly younger than even Ronnie and I both. Which Half a decade over here. I feel really old. old. But, um, you know, who is your fishing hero growing up? Like somebody that you looked up to from the time you got, you know, into bass fishing basically till till now, obviously. I mean, the one thing that I keep going back on is the whole like Polonic age, because like when I started getting into it, like the only thing I would keep watching would be like, when he had that classic finish or when he made that long run at the St. Lawrence or when he won that one tournament at Bull Shoals deep cranking, like those are things like I've watched for like years and years and years. And then to have him like taking photos for me at the way in when I won was, uh, was pretty special. That's very cool. Well, Jay, we appreciate you uh, jumping on the podcast with us, taking a couple minutes. I know a lot of people have asked you, and I'm, I'm glad it didn't work out last week with iCast and that we kind of got a little bit of a different mindset and everything can soak in there. But we yeah. wish you nothing but the best. Um, obviously, here we can be a little biased and subjective, but as soon as Lake Oahe starts, we got to be objective again. So everybody, <laughs> we wish everybody good luck. But it's yeah. very cool to see uh, young anglers, you know, not struggle that's kind of like the bar that's been set. And I don't know if you could speak to that, mm -hmm. but a lot of people are like, congratulations on making the elites, man. Good luck surviving. It's like all of a sudden, it's like a, it's like a caveat. It's right. like, you know, yeah. like the, you would give you two years and, and all these young guys, mm -hmm. you're going to need them because you could be gone just as quick as you got here. Um, and so to see someone find some success early on is very encouraging. Cause I know that it's, you know, people always root you on in your journey. And as soon as the journey yeah. happens, they, they get real quiet. And so I know that that, mm -hmm. that might not be your close knit circle case, but overall people just forget the grind that you're now you've made it, you're on the elites, but it's even harder than the grind was getting there. Right. Yeah, exactly. And one thing I'd like to mention too, for anybody for sure. that's seen any of this or, you know, like wants to get into fishing the opens or the elite series, like my biggest tip of advice to anybody would be just to be confident in what you found in practice and be confident in what you're fishing. You can't let all these people worry you about like, for instance, like the Johnstons, they've been there for 20 years. They've been fishing all these waters. Like you cannot let that get into your head when you're fishing these tournaments. You just have to go out there be confident in what you found, be confident in what you're doing, and then be confident that you can catch the fish for more than one or two days. I mean, that's really the biggest thing in this whole game that I figured out um, is just let those people don't let anything distract you. You have to be in your own zone. And uh, yeah, for anyone that wants to get in, I mean, I was just the guy, you know, fishing local team tournaments just last year. I mean, you can do it if you really put your head to it. I mean, it's obviously, it's not easy. People are going to tell you it's so much money and this and that, but you can do it if you put your mind to it. Well said there, Jay. Uh, Kyle, you got anything else? I, the one thing I was just going to add is, um, you know, obviously being at ICAST last week, I told Jay this in person, but I want to give him a little bit of credit. I think he was bar none the most popular person at that entire show. I don't think I ever walked past him and he wasn't doing anything, <laughs> talking to somebody. Uh, I even did the Instagram takeover there for a little bit and he was the most requested person on that. You know, who, who do we want to talk to by far? So uh, last thing I would want to say is just congratulations. Obviously soak it in. You got a little bit of time um between now and the the next one but uh like i said congratulations man and uh, extremely well done thank you i appreciate it
It makes sense, Kyle, that he was so requested because people wanted to hear from him because he's so quiet. They hadn't heard much from him so far through his win. So I said it, I said it uh, the other day, but you got a million dollar smile to go with that hundred thousand dollar payday. And I was like, that's, he's not going to cry on stage. He's not going to fist pump and, and punch <laughs> and punch Dave Mercer off the stage or anything like that, but he's going to, he's going to smile. And I, and for me, that told me he gets it. He understands how, how big this is. And also and I hate to say it, you could fish for 20 more years and never get an elite series title. Yeah. And so to get it here, whenever you can get a win, you got to enjoy it because it's super cool. So congratulations, man. Thank you, guys. Thanks for having me on. Kyle, it's refreshing to see, you know, a young guy. We we talk about the elite series and, and young guys taking over the sport, but really the youngest of the young, you know what I'm saying? Uh, the all-time Elite Series youngest winner ever, 23 years and 26 days for Jay Shakira. It's super cool to see him do that. In a sport filled with a lot of young guys, the most recent young winner was Patrick Walters in 2020, and he was 26 years old. So you could be a young guy and still be well-seasoned angler. And for Jay Shakira to do it, I think in his bio it says he likes clear, smallmouth bodies of water, and he likes rivers. And so St. Lawrence and Ontario, I mean, that's the perfect recipe. Yeah, absolutely. And and like you said, it's kind of funny to think about. We talk about young guys a lot, and I don't know what the threshold for that number is. Uh, it seems like really, honestly, anywhere but, you know, less than 35, 30, you know, like in the low 30s or, or less. But when you talk about just how young Jay is, he makes you and I look old, which uh, a lot of times when we're talking about anglers, I feel like, you know, even the young ones, so to speak, are about our age or maybe a tad bit older. So definitely really cool um, to see Jay do what he did to be there in person. I mean, that was fantastic. Um, you know, I, I think it um, really, like you said, speaks volumes to how, you know, dominating of, you know, how, how dominant these young guys are coming into the Elite Series and being. I mean, it's, it's not an easy task. Um, Jay made it look really easy, but uh, it's definitely not as easy as it seems. And he's, he's really killed it all year. How old are you? 27 and change? 26. 26. Okay. Well, I'm 20. I just turned 29 July 4th. So I'm 29. You're 26. And like we mentioned, yeah, young guys are guys that we either fished against in college or that were just before us, you know, they, they just turned 30 this year or something. And so it's very weird to see the, the cooks and the Walters and the Whitakers of the world that are now 28, 29, 30, that they're now, you know, they're getting to be five, half a, half a decade into their pro career, but they've been yeah. doing this for the opens for multiple years before that. And so super cool to see that. And honestly, um, we talk about it every single elite series pro, even the ones that, get kicked out each year you know there, there's going to be a handful that get kicked out each year they all have the ability these 90 or 100 anglers all have the ability to win an elite series event for some guys the weather has to be perfect for them the whole time for some guys they can't lose a fish at all during the week some guys they have to have an area to themselves whatever there's some guys who can win a four-day elite event in in a crowd you know what i'm saying so everybody has there, you know, some guys, I would probably need seven things to go right for me to win. Brandon Pollock needs two things to go right for him to win. You know, Gerald Swindle needs this to go right for him to win, things like that. And so I've always said, at least recently, is these guys all have the skill to make top tens and possibly win events when they get in the top 10. But really the ultimate test of skill for an elite series pro is the ability to not have a finish worse than 75th the ability to not have a bottom 10 or bottom 15 finish because that kills you in your points race you cannot make a single blip on the radar of the season you think about matt airy matt airy hasn't made a bunch of top 10s this year he hasn't set the world on fire he's eighth in angler of the year so you can have a fantastic season without having a tremendous high because you have not had a tremendous low. And so to see Jay Shakira, to see some of these young guys pop up, basically won an event, you know, won each event to be able to do this is really, really cool. And for Jay to do it the way he did, all the records we've already talked about with him, 102 pounds of smallmouth. He did it unofficially first on Bassmaster Live, obviously during the weigh-in. Corey had to weigh in first because he's lower in the field. So he, he gets to be the official one, but no one in their right mind is ever going to say he's the first one to do it because if you watch Bassmaster Live, Jay Shakira broke 100 pounds first, but uh, especially for, you know, a, a milestone like that. And I'll say, Kyle, we were wrong. 
where if we did a show of where we were right and where we were wrong we could do an hour-long show for an event how many predictions are thrown out there but i will say right now i'm sorry st lawrence river lake ontario i was wrong i thought 90 pounds and change was achievable it always is achievable i just didn't think 100 would be doing that and we also have to apologize to some of the pundits who said a lot of spawning fish would come into play we saw a lot of that on day one and two and then they just transitioned to be shallow fish on day three and four. But man, 100 pounds exceeded our expectations, and they really got the the pristine conditions to do it. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the thing is I, I was also with you on thinking it would not reach 100 pounds. Um, as you know, if, if you've listened to the podcast at all, I always err on the side of caution, um, whether it be <laughs> reverse psychology or whatever you want to call it. I am always trying to underestimate maybe in my head because it seems like a lot of times that's what ends up happening um you know the weights will be a tad lower than maybe we really expect uh this one was absolutely not the case i mean these guys blew it off you know blew the doors off of it and what the first day of the event 64 20 pound bags or 60 well you might know the number 61 61 i mean that's insane i mean it, it was it was funny Honestly, throughout the way, and you know, is that they're at weigh in every day to where you know, days two, three, and four, you could catch a 22 pound bag and nobody would even look up. Nobody would even look up. Nobody, I mean, it's almost like nobody cared. I want to know how many people you drove by on Bash Track that had over 20, but wasn't like some crazy bag. And you just probably drove by so many guys that didn't stop to take photos because you were headed to someone who had 24 plus that day, which was for some of those days was, was strong. But like you said, yeah, 61 on day one. 54 on day two, number of 20 pound bags, 36 out of 47 anglers on day three, and then nine out of 10 on day four. The one guy who didn't had mechanical problems and lost part of his day to fishing, fishing wise. So yeah, you mentioned it. I mean, you're driving by people that have 22 pounds because it's just a drop in the bucket at the St. Lawrence and Lake Ontario. No, hundred hundred percent to, to give some uh, foresight on that. We definitely had that opportunity almost every day, probably about three or four times a day. Um, it was interesting to see, obviously, the amount of guys. You, you knew there was going to be a lot more guys in the lake. Obviously, a, a significantly shorter run. But it, it's funny when you look at the, you know, the Bass Track map and when you see where everybody's kind of at and get a feel for that. Um, it's it's it was unique that even though it's a huge place and you can spread out hundreds of miles, it seemed like there was little pods of guys just basically in a general area. Um, so yeah, I mean, you'd be out there on the water and of course you'd, you'd pass by somebody that had 23 or 24 pounds. You're like, well, you know, that's, that's really not that impressive compared to the guy we're headed to, or, you know, the group of guys we're headed to. So now you definitely saw a lot of that. And, uh, it is really, I think honestly, even from my perspective, um, maybe taking it for granted a little bit, because it was just like, everybody was doing it to the point that it was hard to think back, you know, all the times that it's been super close to getting to a hundred pounds and it's been, it's obviously been really good every time we've been, but um, just how much better this time was, I think, uh, like I said, even myself, I've taken it for granted being there and getting to see it in person. I think me and Tommy Sanders talked about it uh, during commercial breaks and on Bassmaster Live. We did a video about the history and records that were broken this week or set this week. That's why I like to say history was made and some records were broken because you can't break a 100 pound smallmouth record that never existed. You had to make that record. So they made that record. But I was telling him other than Falcon, Falcon was the one they had 80 anglers out of 100 on day one of that event that had 20 pounds. And obviously, when you have an eight to 10 pound largemouth, that has a bigger ability to jump your overall weight up more than a five pound smallmouth. And so Brandon Polinick said it perfectly. It's not when you get to smallmouth events, it's not about the size of your biggest smallmouth. It's about the size of your smallest smallmouth. We saw guys, I think Kyle Welcher had 21 and a half, 22 pounds on day one, and he had the biggest bass of the tournament, 612. So it's not about how big your biggest bass is. It's about how small your smallest bass is. And so some of these guys that were catching a five pounder is their smallest. I mean, they can't help but get 26, 27 pounds. And so uh, kudos to Jacob Fouts for breaking the all-time elite series smallmouth record with 27.15 on day one. And then a couple guys came up just short of that previous 27.12 mark. And they had 27.11, 27.6, things like that. But Fouts got to break that record for three days before – Corey Johnston broke it with 28.8. So incredible to see some of these things. And, and I said that on live, I said, man, if Corey wants to get a hundred pounds, he's going to have to have close to 30 today because 
he had about 25 and 25 on day one and two. So he had 50 pounds uh, for two days. And then he only had 21 and change. And so we're like, to get to 50 pounds, you're going to have to have 28 plus pounds. And boy, did he do it to sneak in and be the second angler uh, with 100 pounds in a small mouth event. The Johnsons had to get in on that. If they if they got here and got third, fourth, or fifth or something, and two guys broke 100s and neither one of them were a Johnston, I don't know if they could live with themselves. But uh, looking at the I'm, – I'm looking up. I screenshotted some leaderboards. I don't know if you guys can see that. But I screenshotted the Lake Fork leaderboard from this season and the St. Lawrence leaderboard. Two, a couple things were very, very cool to me in that. Uh, it took 92 pounds, two ounces to be 10th place at Fork. It was 91.7 at the St. Lawrence. Then you go through and the top six all had to break 98 pounds to be in the top six. Same for both lakes. Brian knew it was 98.14 and uh, sixth place was 98.1. I want to say uh, Stetson got third, Zaldane got fourth. I think lahue it was right above lahue somebody like that maybe chris johnston had uh 98 pounds there to get sixth place and higher two 100 pound bags i mean absolutely insane for smallmouth that you could even compare it to a falcon and a fork with some statistics but like we said other than falcons uh 80 bags on day one the 60 was the 61 was the most we've ever had in a tournament and then 160 20 pound bags overall out of 237 possible days or limits of fishing. That's absolutely incredible that you have 66% of the bags weighed in this week were over 20 pounds, over in that event, over 20 pounds, 66% of them, 67, I think. Absolutely crazy. And, and it's hard to, other than throwing out stats that fantasy nerds like me and dorks like to, uh, to know, that's the only way you can do it because it's never happened before. And so absolutely astounding that, Tommy Sanders and I said, hey, maybe 20 pounds a day will get you into the final day. It'll get you close. You know, if you have 60 pounds, you'll be like maybe top 15. You'll be close to a top 10. 43rd place was 60 pounds. We thought it would maybe be 15th or something. It was 43rd place. Almost the entire day three cut averaged 20 pounds a day. Yeah, and that's that's what was crazy after day one. Obviously, with that many 20-plus pound bags, you could look all the way down and think to yourself that somebody with 20 pounds even – which I think was Wes Logan, I think was the last guy in with 20 pounds. Revet, Tyler Revet too, they were tied, yeah. yeah. Both those guys were 20 pounds even. And those guys are pretty far out of the cut range, which just seems just seems crazy to think about. And I obviously got to talk to Wes about it, and he was he was pretty bummed that the one time he, he felt like he really caught smallmouth good. It was it just wasn't good enough. But um speaking now, you of know, that, I, I think I think that three or four of my 13 fantasy fishing players, whether it was Mercury Dragon in the lake or rappel of bassmaster fancy fishing average 20 pounds a day and miss the cut like three or four of my guys had 20 pounds a day but they were one of the eight anglers that had 40 plus pounds that didn't make the top 47 so like you said you caught them and you didn't do a dang thing and I, my guys didn't do a dang thing right they're barely missing the cut that's that's another thing i think needs to be brought up you know we haven't talked about this me and you you know even at all uh, off camera on camera is the fact that this entire season we've basically deemed it as like the slugfest season. I mean, almost every event that we've had to this point, the, the hundred pound mark has been a conversation, right? So, I mean, I don't know that, um, obviously it hasn't happened, but twice, I guess, but you know, the St. Lawrence River does a favor for all these times we've been telling you guys that this tournament's going to be a hundred pounds. This tournament's going to be a hundred pounds. I mean, it, this one kind of made up for it because we didn't even think it was going to make, you know, going to be a century belt. And, uh, Ended up being that anyway, so I uh, can't complain there. I think it was the second season in elite history where we've broken the 100 pounds in a tournament twice, and that was after Fork. Then we did it a third time, which has never happened. Obviously, having Santee, Fork, and um, and uh, the St. Lawrence River, absolutely crazy. And then what's crazy is when you look at it, Lake Oahe was predicted by a lot of people because they either pre-fished up there or just reports from up there – it's for one people go up to the St. Lawrence to smallmouth fish. People don't go to Lake Oahe to smallmouth fish. They do it. They go walleye fishing, but Lake Oahe has the opportunity to maybe put up some St. Lawrence numbers, maybe top weight, maybe not full 20 pound bags. Maybe it comes down to earth when you get around 25th, 26th, 30th, whatever the cut line, but the top weight, a lot of people said it's going to take 90 something pounds there, maybe a hundred. And who knows what weather, weather is going to be seriously, 
the factor there. If we have a lot of wins, it'll affect it. But absolutely incredible that we're dishing out all these accolades for smallmouth. Uh, to think that we've done the 713 in 2020 with Paul Mueller there for big bass, and that was a smallmouth. To see so many of these other fish, to see the way they caught them, um, with Jay throwing a drop shot with the striking half shell. A lot, of, a lot of these guys throwing a hair jig as well. Ned rigs were huge for guys like um, Stetson was obviously throwing a drop shot, but also through a Ned rig. So did Shane LeHue. That was huge for him. And then to see some guys mix it up. And obviously Chris Saldane likes to power fish whenever he can. He got to do some of that, um, you know, on, on the final day in the morning and some of the other days, but obviously mixing in the other techniques. So we got to see a lot of things. We got to see Kobe Krieger on camera, not only throw a jerk bait, but throw a pop bar. Uh, to see some of those things happen. I said on Bass Live, no offense to Little Rock water. We got some pretty good water. There's a lot of places that have it worse. But I said, our water is pretty good. And if I fill up my bathtub, the St. Lawrence is clearer than my bathtub is. It's absolutely astounding, some of the visuals we get there. No doubt. Yeah, it's, it's unusual. And I've been to different lakes in my life where this is the case. But, you know, obviously the lack of wind on most every day of the tournament, you could be sitting in 17 foot of water and see the bottom like it was like six inches away, um, which, you know, is, is insane. I mean, obviously it's like that pretty much all the time, but you couldn't tell because of the waves and the ripple and everything else. But with a lack of wind, I mean, it was incredible. You could, you could see, even if we were sitting way off the spot, which, you know, and that's kind of the, the natural thing you have to do when you're covering somebody fishing for smallmouth. But even if you were way off the spot, you could look down and be like, maybe we're too close because <laughs> you can still see the bottom. <laughs> but it's like my graph says 27 feet. Well, <laughs> right. you have to realize like they might be fishing in closer to like seven or eight foot of water, but we're way away from where uh, where they're actually trying to fish. But but no, it, it was really interesting, even though I've been out on the, the lake several times now uh, to see it so calm for you know a period of days to where you could genuinely tell just how clear the water is. Yeah, and, and we, we always think about Lake Ontario being just a huge abyss, you know, a, a giant ocean, and it is. But when you think of some of these places, you don't think that there's shallow areas there. You think the whole lake is just deep. And if you're going to be shallow, you got to be in the river. But like we, like you said, there would be clusters of anglers. I'd see them on the Bass Track map, private, you know, for our eyes only, just finding people. There'd be three or four on a point. And I'm like, they're not all fishing a drop or something. It might be, they, somebody might be up on the point and then in the back of a bay, there's, you know, all those flats in the back of a bay. Even just a cluster of boulders changes the depth contour for even a 40 foot stretch. We saw Corey Johnston fishing a flat where there was a rock seam and off of it, you could see it did get dark green where it was deeper. And then up on it, it was just, you could walk and have your ankles barely get wet. You know, it was seemingly like that. Uh, to see some of the visuals with a drone where you could see Jacob Fouts fishing around and you could see smallmouth and, and like Brandon Pollock on day one, you can see smallmouth swimming around on the drone, like absolutely no places hardly in the world. Can you do that? Uh, so what a great episode talking to Jay. Uh, we've got a lot in store for the Bassmaster podcast coming up over the next couple episodes. Uh, we might be talking about the new open structure that definitely went over well with everyone who was watching. They were super excited about the changes that we made. So we're going to get to talk to the men in charge of the opens about that, possibly of the new schedule coming out as well in the next couple of weeks and months. Um, and then also we'll be talking about the kayak race coming up over the next couple of weeks and months as well as they're going to be wrapping up the Old Town Angler of the Year race there at their last stop. Plus, Kyle, we've got two Elite Series events coming up. And then right after that, we have a college championship. We've got a lot of different tournaments coming up. We're super excited about. This is great to have a little bit of a break. I appreciate you giving us a glimpse inside of ICAST last week on the Inside Bassmaster podcast. But when we're leaving the St. Lawrence, you got any last words for what a memorable week to just roll into ICAST from is, is the St. Lawrence? It's all seemed like a little bit of a blur, so I don't really have a whole lot to add. I've only been, only been back um, from a two-week two week stint, excuse me, um, just for a couple of days now, so it's all seemed like a blur, uh, but I've enjoyed getting to go back, and I've talked about this a lot on the podcast, getting to go back and watch some of the uh, the live action, because obviously I don't get to see everything. Uh, might be with one, one or two anglers for a few days, obviously, so uh, I've definitely enjoyed it, and like I said, I think the, the longer I've had – to kind of reflect on the tournament itself. It's made me appreciate how much um, 
you know, that, that means to me, even just to be there, just because that is history. I said that to Dan O'Sullivan before uh, Corey Johnson went on stage. And I was like, this is literally history. Like that's the best way to put it. Like this is Bassmaster history. And in the moment you might not realize it. Cause like I said, it just become, it had become the norm to see everybody weigh such big bags, but, uh, but it was, it was really pretty amazing. And then, uh, and then I would like to apologize for my uh, shakiness for the iCast uh, podcast. <laughs> it was obviously pretty hectic. Uh, there's so many people walking around and things of that nature. We uh, not at all, not at all. We, we did the best we could, but it was uh, it was not my best performance. So I hope I hope anybody that watched that enjoyed it. And uh, that's all I've got, Mister Ronnie Moore. Well, Kyle, appreciate you. Appreciate Jay Shakir coming on as a guest as well, the champion of the St. Lawrence River in Lake Ontario. Hey, to cap it off, I said the town of Clayton uh, and all those towns surrounding it, it could be home of the first, your home of whatever, you know, like Kitty Hawk, North Carolina is first in flight, all these different things. Clayton, North New York can now say uh, first Century Club smallmouth Bassmaster event, any event. Absolutely awesome. Kyle, appreciate you, man. See you in the next one.